All right, going to answer a letter here I have on the um, ESV and a sister in the Lord wanting to leave a church building that she's going to and some criticisms and attacks on the King James Bible. And uh, so, yeah, I'm going to have to, you know, I'm going to keep the name private and everything else here. But this is something I've been needing to do, to do and I've been real busy. So sorry about that. I'm getting right back to you here with this video. Um, it says here, Dear Brian, thank you for all of the time that you put into your videos. Since you are currently studying the ESV and its errors, I saw this as a good time to ask for some help. I want to end membership with an ESV reading church, and I am struggling with how to go about it in an appropriate and biblical manner. All right. Um, <clears throat> I have left different church buildings, and we're going to get into this, you know, as we go through the letter here. But you have to understand that you are accountable to God. And if you are part of something that is unbiblical, there are no spiritual ties there in terms of God's going to hold you accountable if you leave and whatever else. Um, are there right ways to leave? Are there wrong ways to leave? Yeah. Um, I think that the best thing to do is just to, uh, you don't have to be nasty about it. You don't have to just, you know, make a big scene or whatever else, but just make it plain why you're leaving and leave. Don't stick around. Uh, you will find the, uh, there's no quicker way to get out of fellowship with the Lord than to continue going to a place that rejects His Word. And you will feel miserable. Believe you me. That's one of the things when you become born again as a Christian. Uh, yes, you can still sin. Uh, in spite of what people say about what I preach, Christians can still sin. Christians do still sin. Obviously. But, the thing that changes is when you're born again, you're now a child of God and God will loving, lovingly chasten you. And when you are sinning, you will feel miserable with it. And I can say from plenty of experience, years and years of experience, you go to some church building someplace where you know that the preacher doesn't believe what he's preaching. He's a liar. He's a hypocrite. He stands up there and preaches out of a book that he believes is, has errors in it and whatever the, you know, whatever else. And it's a social club and the whole deal. Um, you go to a place like that and you just kind of want to compromise because family's going there or friends are going there or whatever else. You're going to feel miserable until you finally come out of that place. You walk out and you cut the ties and it's uncomfortable. I've had some really uncomfortable times with that. Um, you know, sometimes I've had pastors that I really genuinely love in the Lord, and they're just, you know, I remember the one guy, um, a Baptist church I was going to, and great man, um, I believe he's saved, but he's part of this church organization thing, and just too proud to let it go. The thing was falling apart. It was not of the Lord. It was coming to naught, and he was just trying to keep the ship going. You know, it's sinking, and he's down there bailing the water out, you know. Uh, and he just couldn't let it go. And I had, I was supposed to be teaching Sunday school and you know, I was involved in everything there. And, and I just came up to him after the one service and I just was, I just was so vexed being there. I just couldn't stand it anymore. And I said, uh, Hey brother, I said, uh, I got to just tell you, this is going to be my last Sunday. And he kind of looked and he said, Oh, he said, have you changed your views? And I said, no, I haven't changed my views. I said, uh, there's things that are being done here that aren't according to the scriptures. And it was a very uncomfortable thing, and it was very, you know, I felt like I was going to throw up. I mean, I was really nervous. and But I just thought, you know what, I'm not going to feel comfortable until this, this, I cut this tie. And I remember it was a, he said, okay. And we shook hands. He said, uh, all right, we'll see you. And I said, um, okay. And I turned around, I thought, I'm not going to say God bless you, brother, because he was wrong. He was in sin for being at this place and whatever and keeping things going. There was major problems that were being overlooked and the whole deal. I walked out in the parking lot. I remember I walked, I went, the door shut behind me, opened that door up, and I walked out in the parking lot and the door shut behind me. And I, I literally just went, <sighs> I could just feel just that cut from this thing. You know, and you say, well, that was the last Baptist church you went to. No, unfortunately not. <laughs> I went to another one years after that, but that's a whole other story. But uh, if, if the Lord is starting to put into your mind that you're in some church building and you know it's wrong and you know it's wicked and whatever else, 
you are not going to have peace until you cut the ties. And you need to cut the ties from this place. We'll continue here. If you were currently tied into a modern church membership, how would you approach leaving and what would be your concise and biblical statement for doing so? Have you, how have you ended a church membership in the past? Well, there you go. Just told you a story. Um, again, if you're officially on their membership list, I know that uh, you wrote out kind of a... Um, I'm just seeing if there's any kind of names on here that, you know... Uh, you know, I'm not going to show the letter because there's some personal stuff on here. But, you know, there's a little bit of a letter on the back there that that just kind of is giving them, you know, this is the way it is, just laying it out and saying, you know, I'm done here. That's the thing to do. If, you're, if you've been officially been brought in as a member and whatever else, then just say, please remove my name and all my information from all your membership lists and all your other functions, whatever kind of a thing. But let's uh, continue here. I would like to make as little noise as possible. I do not wish to make a big statement to the congregation. I knew that my church's endorsement of the ESV, NIV, NASB was an issue. But after explaining to a few people why I am leaving, I'm realizing that the problem is much worse than I thought it was. Yeah. I am being challenged, scrutinized in a quote-unquote loving way. Oh yeah, we're concerned about you. I think that you're, I, I understand that you have, you know, thoughts and ideas, but we're concerned with the direction that you're heading. We feel that you're being deceived. Yeah, because you want to stick with the King James Bible, you know. <clears throat> and I've been told that I do not have a reason for leaving that is justified by Scripture. Okay, now you're going to see the hypocrisy with some of the questions that this sister is being asked here. The hypocrisy of the people in that church building. They'll talk about doing things by the scriptures and then they'll turn right around in the same breath and say there are no scriptures. All translations are just none of them are inerrant. None of them, uh, you know, whatever. They're not the perfect word of God. But we must do things according to the scriptures. Huh? <laughs> it's lying. Below is some of the backlash that I have received so far. We're going to go over each of these points. I'm going to give you a little bit of a rebuttal to each one. Quote, this is what people have said to her. I have seen an argument like yours fail again, time and time again. Okay, in other words, you, you, you come out with this King James Dualism, it just fails over and over again. Um, well, that's why I don't debate a lot of these new version people. Because no matter what you say, they're going to come out saying that they were the winner. Oh, He didn't prove anything against our new version. Well, it's kind of like evolution versus Bible belief, okay? Bible believers know that the world gets worse and worse and worse. Evolution says, no, the world gets better and better and better. So when evidence is presented, the Bible believer looks at it and says, well, that's got to be a lie because it's saying things are getting better. The evolutionist looks at it and says, well, that has to be the truth because it says things are getting better. See? Bible believer looks at the world and says, wow, look at all these earthquakes. Things are getting worse. The evolutionist looks at it and they say, well, it's been bad in the past too, so it's really not getting worse. It's just stable and it's always been like this. <laughs> See, you have two different opposing philosophical views to say, you know, I, I hate to say Bible believers are a philosophical view, but they look at the world a certain way. All right. Well, if you're a Bible believing Christian and a new version Christian, the new version Christian believes that the King James Bible is inferior to the English Standard Version. Let me switch. Let me put the ESV in my left hand. That's more important there, if you understand Matthew chapter 25. Um, this was good. This is better. And what comes out in another 10 years will be even better than this. You see? And you say, which one is perfect? Well, none of them are perfect. We're just continuing to bring out new translations. It's a work in progress. It isn't, thus saith the Lord. It's, the Lord is saying this for you today, but it could change tomorrow. All right. So again, uh, the arguments of King James Bible believers have failed time and again. According to who? Number two, if the King James Version is the standard, why didn't it exist sooner than 1611? Uh, okay, well, the King James Bible, in terms of the Receptus line of Bibles, um, does go back, way back, into the old Latin Vulgate and, and some of the Waldensian 
translations and whatever else, and there were some Receptus type of translations that existed long before the King James Bible. But as far as the perfect Word of God, again, they're, see, they're, they're changing the argument here. You know, if the KJV is the standard, you know, where was it before 1611? That's a very common argument against the King James Bible. Um, and it's very easy to rebut that. You just simply say, uh, well, I'll answer that with another question. Where is it today? If this isn't the standard, the King James Bible is not the standard, then uh, what is it? That's the real issue here. All right. That's what's really going on. What is the standard? <clears throat> Number three. You've got to love this one. Here, read this book called The King James Only Controversy by James White. I got uh, two editions of it over here. I have his uh, uh, older edition here and the newer edition there. Okay. Um, you know, both filled with a bunch of stupid lies. But again, he does the exact same thing. The King James Version was good, and you can you can use it. It's okay, but we've got better Bibles now. You say, well, okay there, Dr. White. Um, is this Bible perfect? No. Was this one perfect back when it was written in 1611? No. Where's the perfect Bible? Well, it's somewhere in the manuscripts. It's kind of just, you know, you have to get really high up in the scholarly realms, and, you, and they don't really know either. Everybody kind of determines what is right in their own eyes. But uh, the way you con the suckers and you get their money is you just stand up and say, I believe in the scriptures alone. And I believe that we as Christians need to stand by the scriptures. <laughs> you know, they'll lie to the people, get their money. That's what James White is. He's a lying snake. And just the fact that anybody in a church building would recommend James White, they're lost. I mean, the whole... You know, I can't even stand reading a guy's book. You know, I went through it one time many years ago. I'm eventually going to do some kind of thing to debunk the thing. It's it just, you know, it's like taking a, a swim in a sewer, you know. And you can read that and recommend that as a Christian? I don't think so. <clears throat> Number four, you should be careful when you say that the KJV is the meat Bible because this offends Christians who have been saved and have been walking with God for a long time. Uh... Okay, what defines a Christian? Somebody that says, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in any Bible out there. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. How does that work? Is the Jesus is just a figment of your imagination? What is your authority for saying that you're even saved? A Bible that uh, has errors in it, and it's not perfectly translated? Well, then, how do you know it was perfectly translated where it tells you how to be saved? They're hypocrites, in other words. Objection number, what is this, five. To prefer the KJV over another translation is no problem. To say that it is inerrant is unscriptural because there is no divine promise of inerrancy. Okay, so the way we prove a Bible is inerrant is by having the scriptures, but there are no scriptures because there is no inerrant Bible. Um, I've never been to your church that you go to there, the Southern Baptist Church, but are the walls kind of white and padded? <laughs> I mean, it's insane, this stuff that people come up with and think that they're Christians. The scriptures, we need the scriptures to prove the inerrancy of the scriptures, but there are no scriptures because they're not inerrant. You ought to rent your face out to a cuckoo clock if you believe that kind of thing. <laughs> Nuts. You know, just my word. And there are plenty of scriptures, you know, in the King James Bible that talk about this book being inerrant. You know, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. All right. Every word is pure. All right. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. I mean, there's so many scriptures that talk about the purity of God's Word. I mean, again, think about what these people are really confessing. These people that say these attacks against Bible-believing Christians. They're saying 
God wrote a book at one time in the past, and it was never really a whole book because the manuscripts of Genesis were worn out and gone by the time the first century came about and they were writing the New Testament manuscripts. So there was never really a, a Bible of containing all the original autographs. And so God kind of wrote it over a thousand years and thousands of years and kind of lost it or maybe caught it up to heaven and, and he's up there just going, well, I'm going to give you a bunch of poor copies and try to sort out your salvation. And these people think they're Christians and they call people like me a cult leader. Yeah. Uh, number six here. There is no validity or orthodox view that says the KJV is any less the product of human efforts than modern translations. Okay, no validity or orthodox view. Um, according to who? According to James White and his little Jesuit buddies? like Mitchell Pacwa, an actual Jesuit that endorses his book on the uh, Trinity, the pagan Catholic Trinity. Well, according to these you know, people that, that uh, hate the King James Bible, uh, there's no validity to your arguments. Wow. Man, that just destroyed my position. You know, sure. I mean, I go down to the bar here locally and, and say, who here thinks that alcohol is wrong? And they all say, you get out of here, you crazy preacher. I said, well, I guess I need to change my position because I couldn't find anybody that dis, you know, that agreed with me at the bar. <laughs> it's insane. Um, no, it's perfectly valid to say that this book is, you know, infallible and inerrant. Perfect word of God. Unless you're lost. And, you know, of course, they're comparing the thing of uh, the King James Bible to modern uh, versions and things like that. Um, even just from a just scholarly, you know, men and whatever else, uh, the translators of the King James Bible had no equal ever. Uh, and seven years to do the translation, you get some dope head like Eugene Peterson with the message and he's writing into this thing out and it's just one of the most stupid, perverted things you could ever read. You know, the NIV done partly at a university in Salamanca, Spain, Catholic university where Ignatius de Loyola, founder of the Jesuit order, was trained at this university. Years later, they're doing the NIV partly there. An order of nuns operates the residence and they're talking about affectionate ties of Christian love binding the hearts of all together in a marvelous way. Got the book right over there. You can watch my Real Bible Version issue exposed if you want to know more on that. Sickening. Uh, so to compare the King James Translation Committee and process to that of modern versions, uh, ignorance is all I can say on that. Uh, let's see here. Like all translations in all languages, there is no divine promise of inerrancy. By what standard? It's ridiculous. Only the original Greek and Hebrew texts have such an assurance. Where does the Bible say that? Where does I mean again? What is your what is your standard? To be able to make a statement like that. It's insane. This does not mean we cannot trust our English translations. Instead, it means that if ever if there is ever a question of authoritative meaning, we need to go to the original languages to settle the matter, not the King James. Okay. Um, which one? Here we have the majority text right there. Hodges and Farstad. Here we have the Texas Receptus with the Masoretic Hebrew Old Testament. Here we have the 25th, the 27th, and the 28th editions of the Nestle's text. Which one is the perfect Greek? Which one? Oh, and there are multiple other editions of other copies of other, you know, texts and things like this. Which one's the right one? the inspired original, you know, go to the original languages. And then you get uh, into the thing of lexicons and whatever else, and they have different meanings and different ways of defining different Greek words and Hebrew words and whatever else. Or you can just go with the Bible that God has used and blessed since its inception, over 400 years of being proven on the battlefield, spiritual battlefield. And a lot of these new versions come out, the uh, 
revised version, the first one from the Alexandrian type text, um, that thing comes out and uh, it's sunk in a few years. They had to come out with it again, you know, and stuff. The American Standard Version, 1901, and years later, the 1960s, they had to, you know, Dewey Lockman, I think it was, had to come out with a new American Standard Version. They just keep regurgitating, you know, kind of like a dog that's returned to his own vomit again. They just keep on puking out these new versions, you know, more accurate, new translation, just <laughs> puking the junk out. Go back to the Hebrew and the Greek. You know what's funny, too? I've never met one person that was saved from the Nestle's text or the Textus Receptus or any other edition of a Greek text. They claim their salvation came from the preaching and teaching of an English Bible or some other language translation Bible. And then they'll say, but our final authority must be the Greek. Isn't that kind of weird? Another thing here, thought for thought strives to communicate the substance of the original but leaves itself open to the translator's interpretation being imposed. Here's a, now here's a direct lie. Listen to this. The King James falls far more towards thought for thought transla translation in reality. You bunch of stinking filthy liars. They told the sister that. That is an absolute lie. There's formal equivalence and dynamic equivalence. Dynamic equivalence is the thought for thought, okay? Formal equivalence is you're trying to get it as close to the Greek text that you are using. That's what the King James translators used. They were masters of the English language. I mean, the, the writing diction, dictionaries in Persian, I mean, they're just, the stories about these translators are just, just mind-blowing. You know, and to say that, oh, they did thought for thought, they did more of that. Please. Kind of comparing it, you know, a, a modern day dynamic equivalent would be, say, you know, the NIV, and, and then you get one that's just a demonic equivalent, uh, like the message or something. That would be the far end of that spectrum. Formal equivalence is trying to get it as close to the text as possible. But you know the funny thing? You get the ESV, like this piece of junk right here. They'll say, this is done with a formal equivalence. This is, this is one that's as close to, you know, this is the most accurate translation to date of the best, you know, the Nestle's text and everything else, the two oldest and best manuscripts, you know. But what they won't tell you is the two oldest and best manuscripts, codices B and LF, actually contain apocryphal books as part of the inspired scriptures. That's why you pick up a Catholic Bible, they have apocryphal books in as part of the inspired scriptures. But yet, the weird thing is, they don't translate those books. At least not yet. New Revised Standard Version is starting to put them in. But if this is the most accurate translation of, you know, Codices B and LF, why don't they include the apocryphal books? Because they're not ready to yet. There's still some Protestants out there that have a few brains left. You know, a few brain cells that haven't been destroyed by, a, you know, modern Vatican-inspired teaching in these church buildings. Okay, it is dangerous to elevate any translation to the level of a divine er inerrancy. Okay, uh, chapter and verse, proof. Uh, what, is, what is the standard to be able to make a statement like that? So it's dangerous for me to say that this is God's book. It'd be safe for me to, safer for me to stand in the pulpit. I don't really stand in a pulpit, but <laughs> to stand and preach and say, this book here is not really God's word. It contains things that I think might be God's word, but this Bible can't be the standard for you today. It can't really tell you how to be saved because if it did, it would be perfect and we know that there's no translation that's perfect. That'd be better than me being honest and saying, this is God's book, this King James Bible. This is God's word. And that's somehow wrong. So you're dealing with lost people, sister. These people at your church that you're going to and things, they're lost. Saved people don't make these kind of statements. Let's continue. You got a couple more here. Uh, do you think you know more about this issue than the elders who have seminary degrees and have studied the Bible for years? Well, if you stick by the King James Bible and they don't, then yeah, you do know more because you're saved and they're lost. No saved person is going to go against the King James Bible and hate it. Not going to happen. No way. 
And again, you have these people that have this weird philosophy. They'll say, well, um, we can prove that there are men out there that have been educated and they, they say that they love Jesus and everything else and they use the new version, so they must be okay. Um, do you realize how bad of a statement that is? I mean, there are people out there that, that uh, rob banks and they get away with it. They haven't been caught yet. And they're nice people. They give some money to the poor, and they're, you know, so it must be okay to rob banks. No. I mean, the fact that the, the vast majority of seminaries in this country are teaching Roman Catholic doctrine right now, and, and especially in regards to the scriptures, uh, that should be kind of a tip off that uh, maybe you don't want to trust somebody that came out of there and to say, well, they're, they're the authority. No, the Bible's the authority. <coughs> Excuse me. Next point here that people have brought up to this sister attacking the King James Bible. Why do you need to see the words Sheol and Hades in the King James Version in order to believe that Paul wrote them? The Alexandrian and Textus Receptus lines both have Sheol written by Paul. Um, well, uh, again, if you're using, you know, um, transliteration where you just basically take, you're not translating the word Sheol being hell in, in Hebrew, Hades or Hades, whatever you want to say. There are different ways to pronounce it. In Greek, being the word Greek word for hell, um, there are a lot of these new versions that just bring it right into the text. They don't translate it, they transliterate it. They move a Greek word or a Hebrew word right into the text. Because, you know, you tell somebody, you know, hey, go to hell. Uh, that's offensive. Go to Sheol. Go to Hades. You know. See, it's not offensive. That's why the new versions are transliterating it there. So, again, you know, to bring that up to one of these people that defends a new version, uh, they're not going to understand it because they're going to hell themselves. And uh, so, you know, they don't see a problem with, with uh, people covering up the reality of hell. It's appealing to lost people when they hear a preacher covering up hell and even denying hell. Um, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 is one of the strongest criticisms of the King James Version. I think this is the one about knowing the plans. Let's just look it up here real quick. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Whereas a lot of the new versions will say, I know the plans that I have for you. You know, and they go, oh, that's so cute. I love it. I feel so warm and fuzzy inside now um, because I, I, he knows the plans he has for me. No, uh, God knows the thoughts. And so, you know, I've actually heard people, they say, oh, I prefer the new version reading. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, um, you know, again, what's your standard? You know, let's, let's look up in the NIV where it talks about, you know, instead of righteousness back in the book of Psalms, the NIV is, you know, they'll change righteousness to prosperity. Well, I like prosperity more than righteousness, so I'll just take the NIV reading rather than the King James reading. I'll say I'll, I like Jeremiah 29 verse 11 in my ESV because it says plans rather than thoughts in the King James Version. So I prefer that. That's not an error in the King James Bible. All right, that's some modern versionist who's out for your money writing what he thinks you want to hear into his translation. All right, continuing here. Next point, the KJV is not in the Bible anywhere. <laughs> so believing in the work of the man is very extreme. I hope you reconsider. Okay, uh, so the King James Bible, you know, King James would have to be mentioned, you know, and everything. Uh, okay, um, yeah, uh, the Bible was finished in the first century. King James wasn't born until the 16th century as a child, and then he was, you know, there in 1604 when the, he commissioned the work of the, you know, translation and things, the authorized version. He authorized it, and then it was seven years, and it was finished, and he died a few years later after that. Um, so, some of the arguments these people come up with is just funny. Next point, just because some people read the KJV in our congregation does not mean they hold the extreme view that it is inerrant. 
Well, if they're continuing to go to a place like that and see no problem, then they're probably lost too, quite frankly. Next point, please do not make, please do not take my having this conversation with you as a harsh judgment of you in any respect. This is not my heart or my intention. I do not think you would say, nor do I think you worship a translation. However, see the old Billy Goat thing there? I'm, I, I believe in you and I da 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 but, or they'll say, however, they butter you up and then they give you the little bit of a jab then. However, the reason this is so important to me is because during your formative growth years as a very young believer, it is pulling you into chasing these type of embroiled controversies instead of a more comprehensive view of scripture and maturing in your faith. But these same knuckleheads just said that there is no such thing as inerrant scripture. So she's saying, I believe that this is the scriptures. I believe that this is God's holy book right here. And they say, uh, that's wrong. It's not inerrant scripture. And the fact that you're going after this when you should be going after inerrant scripture proves that you're somehow wrong. Okay, what is the inerrant scripture? There isn't any. Only the originals. Because that's what you get them back to. They'll say the Greek and the Hebrew. That's a little bit of a smoke screen. They'll try to send you here and you say, which edition uh, is perfect? The 28th, that's the latest edition of the Nestles. Is that one perfect? Can I stay with that one? Can, is that the final one? Well, no. Well, that, well, then it can't be perfect. You see? It's lying. It's deception. Next point. I also wanted to show you that there are gaps in the advocate's arguments. Right. Finally, I hope to illuminate that the cloud of saints who feel convicted as you feel you might is a, is a far minority and that seeking out a church of potentially like mind on this topic might actually lead to a for, forsaking of clear biblical instruction about church fellowship and what it means to covenant together. <laughs> so um, church membership uh, is somehow overthrows truth, absolute truth. Yeah, there's wicked stuff going on here and and everything else, but I got to keep going because that's important. I have to, you know, I have to forsake truth in order to keep fellowship with a bunch of people that are lost. Insanity. Yeah, the KJV was based on roughly 5,000 manuscripts, but not all of them were identical. Yeah, uh, sure, absolutely. <laughs> we now have over 9,300 anyway. You know, well, there's a lot more than that, extant Greek manuscripts. And uh, the vast majority of them line up with the received text, which is the ultimate, ultimately the text that underlies the King James Bible. And the minority text, less than 1% of Greek manuscripts out there, extant, that are found, in other words, that are in museums or universities or whatever, those manuscripts, less than 1%, line up with the changes in the new versions. But again, that's not the real issue here. The real issue is, what is the final authority? This one, this one, or neither. That's the issue. And see, what these devils don't like, these pastors, they're hirelings, they're career preachers. What they can't stand is they can't stand somebody coming up and saying, what's the perfect scripture, pastor? I believe it's the King James Bible. You're not preaching it, you're in sin. You're using a version that comes from the Vatican. Catholics sitting on the translation team. And there were Catholics sitting on the translation team of the ESV, by the way, just as there were with the NIV. Recommended by Catholics. This has never been recommended by Catholics. Had a brother and sister recently tell me that they were going to do the eulogy at one of their relatives' funerals, Roman Catholic relative that they had gotten saved and things, and they were going to do the eulogy there. And they, they said, we're going to read out of the King James Bible. And the priest said, no. They're going to have to read out of a Catholic-approved translation. They will not read out of the King James Bible in this Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And the Protestant churches are being conformed and made more and more and more into Catholic churches as time goes by. And you see these modern preachers, they know that they're hypocrites, they're liars, they're deceivers. They stand up in the pulpit and they preach out of Bibles that they don't believe are perfect or inerrant. They don't believe it for one second. 
And yet they'll flip right around and they'll say, our scriptures, the scriptures have to be your final authority. They're liars. They're deceivers. You don't owe them any allegiance at all. And it is a sin if you continue going there. Let me just tell you that right up front. You will get out of fellowship with the Lord if you continue to go and sit under the ministry of some lying hypocrite like that. Lying hypocrite devil like that. Continuing here with her letter. One of my arguments is that Hades and Sheol or Hades and Sheol are used in place of hell. This makes hell confusing to someone outside of the faith. This is only one of the many errors as you know about. I also question why the modern versions say that Mary was kneeling before Jesus after putting the ointment on his head and the KJV says she was worshiping him. Kneeling could be a way to worship, but it doesn't mean Mary kneeling is the way to worship. Oh, they do this all the time. They demote the deity, the deity of Jesus Christ. They bring him down all the time. They remove a lot of the, a lot of the miracles. They make Jesus a liar. Uh, the new versions are satanic. There's no question about that. The new versions definitely have an agenda. And you look at the translation teams, it's Catholics, open Roman Catholics, working together with, you know, Protestants. Absolutely. And you understand the, the whole reason of the creation of the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order was designed the Counter-Reformation counter to bring all people back under the authority of Rome. And the King James Bible uh, was making all kinds of problems for the Catholic Church for centuries. And so the Jesuits knew we got to get in there and we got to do something about this. And now people are so ignorant, are, are so foolish, that they, they don't even care. They see Jesuits on the translation teams and they go, oh, what's the big deal? You know? <clears throat> Continuing. I know that in many of your videos you have addressed how to approach the answer to many of these questions. I know that based on the inner testimony of the Spirit that leaving the Southern Baptist Convention system is what God wants me to do, but I do experience some doubt when I hit, am hit so hard with all of these statements. Well, hopefully I've answered them now. I refer, refer to this link when I need help. av1611.org. I think that's Terry Watkins' website. It's good stuff there. And sometimes it does, but if you have any advice on how to handle my specific situation, I would love to either receive a response from you or for you to make a video addressing these specific questions. There you go. Sorry, it's a little bit late. When the Bible does say that God is sovereign over all forms of government, to what extent is leaving a modern church that God led me to the correct thing to do? Um, God will lead you sometimes to go to one of these church buildings. I will say that simply to show you how bad things can really get and to show you um, what true hypocrisy is all about. But when the Lord says, okay, you've seen it, now leave. You leave. Um, you get out of there as quick as you can. Uh, these places are filled with devil spirits. Um, just church buildings are some of the most wicked places out there. That's why there's just continual sexual molestation problems in Baptist churches, Catholic churches, Methodist churches, whatever. Uh, there's all kinds of problems in these places. Um, you know, I used to go to a Methodist church, Lampeter United Methodist Church. They were wife swapping there. I'm not joking. People in the worship team were wife swapping. Literally, switching wives and husbands. You know, going through divorces and come back, this one's married to that one now and that one's married to this one. They're wicked, wicked, wicked places. And if the Lord brings you into one of them things and you think, hey, this sounds really great, and all of a sudden He starts to kind of pull back the veil a little bit and you start to see the evil of that place, then you take that and you say, okay, thank you for the lesson, Lord. I've learned my lesson. And I'll not go back to one of these places ever again. And you get out. All right. As far as uh, you know, governmental issues and things like that. As far as you know, not not secular government. I'm talking within the church and whatever. You're not dealing with saved people. All right. Um, and there's the priesthood of the believer as well. I, I need to add that. Yes, there are positions of elders in the church. I understand that. There are older men that can teach the word of God and everything else. Certainly. Uh, but when you're dealing with lost people, false converts, the Bible talks about in perils among false brethren. Uh, when you're dealing with that, you owe them no allegiance at all of any kind. <clears throat> Finally, it says here, I'm leaving my home for the summer, and this is partly why I think it is a good time to transition out of this church. 
The more I am here, the more I want to leave, and the more I realize the brokenness of the Vatican and its manipulation of the Protestant churches. Amen. I know that you do not want your email shared with the public, but this is a time-sensitive issue for me, and I would love to communicate with you as I go through this transition via email. Um, gives the email address there. I'm not going to read that. Uh, I respect your decision regardless and know you are busy, and I pray for God's guidance and comfort through this situation. I would love to hear from you in any way or form, but I would prefer that anything that identifies me by name would remain confidential if you make a video. Try to do that. I will be praying for you, your wife and child, and your ministry. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Um, right there is the verse. Okay, it's typed out there. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I would simply, uh, I mean, if you want to go up to the to the people there, they're going to keep trying to, to mind control you to stay in the place. And they're going to keep throwing little guilt trips on you. And oh, you're, I feel that you're going down a very dangerous path. And I, I, I just, I'm worried about you. You know, all the while, you know, trying to tear down your beliefs in the King James Bible as God's inerrant word. And they're worried about you because of you wanting to believe that this is God's book. You owe them nothing. If your name is on the membership list, okay. Get in there and say, you know, send them a letter or whatever else and say, please remove my name completely remove my name from all your records and everything else. I don't want anything to do with you. Don't try contacting me. You're wicked. You're of the devil. Goodbye. All right? And you will feel a peace when you, you know, a tremendous peace when you cut the ties with a wicked organization like this thing. And by the way, it says there, um, I think you said at one point in time, it's a Southern Baptist church. Uh, the Southern Baptists are very heavily involved in Freemasonry. Um, so again, you could be dealing with actual Satanists in that place. And I'm not joking. I'm not making that up, trying to be dramatic or whatever else. Southern Baptists are very heavily into Freemasonry, the Masonic Lodge, in other words. Uh, the Masonic Lodge is an ancient fraternal order uh, that is dedicated to worship of Lucifer. They're Satanists. So uh, yeah, I'd run from that place. Um, so that is going to be it. Uh, thank you very much for watching.